the museum as an institution with the power to rewrite and redefine art history. And these, of course, are funny words that, you know, I'm bringing here. So, um, so we uh, start with the first kind of uh, um, uh, questions. And the first one is really to, uh, to funny to tell us, uh, give us an overview of the Kunstmuseum Luzern, which you see here uh, on the screen. It's a beautiful uh, building designed by uh, Jean Nouvel in the city of Luzern, so on the lake in Switzerland. And then, um, so first to tell us about the museum. And the second question is that uh, it's about um, your path, that you became director of this museum at the age of 38. So we could say pretty young for, uh, you know, a, a, a really great institution. And we want to, I want to hear, I'm sure everybody wants to hear um, your path in the field and what brought you to uh, direct the Kunstmuseum Luzern. So Fanny, please welcome, uh, tell us. Oh, we have to, you have to unmute one second. Uh, Fanny, you need to, oh, oh okay. Now, now it's fine, yeah? Yeah. Thank you, Nicola, for this very kind introduction. And I'm very glad to be with you tonight and to share some of my ideas, some of the history of my institution, but maybe also we have some space for some feelings or reflections. Yeah. I, I feel a bit in the need that, that it's about feelings also in this difficult time. And um, with uh, the show we just recently opened by Guy Benair and my institution with the title we have lost. So maybe at the end we can come to this. Um, so, but to begin with Kunstmuseum Luzern, it's a very old institution, although the um, building itself is very contemporary. It was founded in 1890, so it's over 200 years old, and it's among the oldest museums here in Switzerland. It was founded by some citizens, so it's not a museum from the state or from the city council, it's really our members, we are a Kunstverein with 2,400 members. And this- uh, uh, Sorry, Fanny, Kunstverein is an art association. Art so, association, yeah, yeah thank you. Of Kunstverein. Yeah. yeah, so the museum belongs to these 2,400 members. And Luzern is a tiny town with 80,000 inhabitants and the region around makes 1 million. It's in the center of Switzerland, and it's a very idyllic, picturesque uh, region with a lake and mountains and boats. You can see on this image, you see the steamboat on the left. Yeah. And it's a very touristic hotspot. So therefore the summer season is the uh, months when we have the highest number of visitors. And we have a collection of approximately 6,000 works but it's not a very stringent, it's a bit a confusing collection, very elective. Um, and we have a huge exhibition space in this building by Jean Nouvel. It's a very beautiful building, but the strange thing is that we are on level four and this makes it difficult to find us. So people just crossing by, they do not realize that there is a museum behind, behind, behind this facade. And you must be informed that you have to take the elevator and then you come on level four where the museum starts. Rest of the building is a concert hall and some restaurants, offices. So it's a mixture of, um, in the evening we have a lot of classic music concerts, but during day it could also happen that the building looks very um, closed. Only on level four we have the exhibition. What you see on this image here is that the floor plan shows you that um, the, in the white part of the floor plan, we have our um, main exhibitions, changing exhibitions, and this is 1,100 square meters, and we change three times a year. And the gray part on the right is the collection, which is rehanged once a year. But I'm not the curator for the collection, I'm the curator for the huge um, changing exhibitions. And 
if you imagine on this floor plan, it's organized like an American city. So it's very hard to understand where you are in the first, second, third room. And the quality of the rooms is totally equal. It's this grayish floor, white walls, and then the ceiling. You have no windows. So orientation is very difficult. And what makes the work for me as a curator even more demanding is that the first space, it's called B150 on this floor plan, is um, the biggest room. I think to tell a story, it would be very helpful to have the biggest room at the end as a highlight, or to have it in the middle as a core of an exhibition. But to have this biggest room as a beginning makes it really demanding that you do not tell too much in the first room. And the other rooms then just become a kind of footnotes. What you can see on the right is several uh, photos from this very first room. And you can understand how different we use it. We have here an exhibition with these swings. And people were allowed to use the swings by Claudia Comte, a young Swiss artist. You ha have then um, in the first room from a Hockney retrospective. You have sometimes a freestanding wall giving some extra information or also to have a video projection on it with um, Sharon Lockhart, which is the, the on the left, the lowest position. We do uh, historic exhibitions and then we decide to paint the walls because it's too hard with this white wall and the dark floor. It is a very... The atmosphere is not um, inviting. It's not like a, a museum with a wooden floor and you can listen to the steps of the other visitors. It's quite a harsh um, atmosphere. It's more like a, a factory. Uh, Fanny, I think it's so important that you also tell us a bit of uh, uh, your background because this is also something we share. We both come <laughs> from the territory of editing. And if you could tell us a, a little bit where you come from, but also um how the space has been shaping your way of curating so just in short if you can give us few elements of in that uh mm -hmm. maybe this leads also to the question um how did i become a 38 director of this institution i started my career as a journalist in a culture monthly magazine and each issue was about one single theme like an architect a filmmaker an author, an artist, and I. my intention always was um, to make my living out of being a writer, to earn enough money with text. But then in the around 2000, I realized how difficult this will become. And I decided to um, apply for other positions and I became assistant curator in a smaller Swiss museum with a collection. And there I realized that as a journalist responsible for one issue with 60 pages, I had one theme, one topic, and I had to start with an introduction, then some side stories, a highlight, and come to an end, a conclusion. But I was not sure if the reader really starts in the beginning of the magazine, or if some readers start with the end of a magazine, or somewhere in middle. So you always had to uh, be aware that that you can tell a story in different directions and in different uh, rhythm. And then in this very first museum I started as an assistant curator, I realized it's a bit the same. Um, telling a story in a museum is not in the two dimensions of a paper magazine, but it's in the three dimensions of a room, of a space. And you are never sure in what direction uh, the visitors will go on. How much time do they spend? How deep will they go into a video installation or in some text? And you need some teasers or some spices um, to spread in the rooms that people have a chance to reconnect with what you are trying to tell them. I think it's very important that you make this point because uh, I think we often uh, see exhibitions, uh, we think of exhibitions as a sort of, you know, uh, like, a, like a chronological uh, 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 order. But in fact, it's really more, as you say, it's more like a story. It's more like an experience. People are moving from one place to the other. I think, and, and sometimes actually, to think of um, editing and to think of uh, kind of patching things together, it's actually an interesting skill. 
that you can have. So uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, point. Uh, I wanted to um, ask you now about uh, uh, these big names that you brought to the museum. I think it's interesting from the point of view of uh, our uh, community, especially those that uh, come to CCA where we usually do different uh, kind of artists. Uh, if you could tell us, uh, um, you know, what was the, the focus when you brought artists like uh, Turner or De David Ockney that have exhibitions everywhere? If you tell us in few words, wh what made them different from the other uh, exhibitions we see of these artists? Um, I have to confess, I did not study art history, but political science and history. And I would not never have had dared to do an exhibition on Turner. I'm not an expert on romantic, but Turner was six times in Switzerland and five times he was, he spent some time, but not just the night, but some weeks in Luzern, beginning of his career and at the end of his life. And when I realized that, and that Turner um, was part of, there was the industrialization in Britain. And as a reaction on this, we had in the art field, the romantic and Turner as a main painter or main artist of romantic came to Switzerland when Switzerland still was a very poor country. And it was really only farmers and nothing around. And these first tourists coming from uh, Great Britain, they brought some money and this money um, developed a new infrastructure like restaurants, hotel, um, etc. And this uh, money also br brought up a kind of citizenship. In former times, you just had these farmers and they had no cultural interest. But these new citizens, they wanted to have a museum, they wanted to have a concert hall, they wanted to have a library and a university. So these citizens, with the money of Turner and his fellows, founded my museum in 1890. And when we celebrated the 200 year jubilee of the institution in 2019, I absolutely wanted to do that with Turner together, with an exhibition with him. And it was this idea, I was writing 60 love letters to Tate to get these loans from Tate. And uh, at the end, I convinced them that it is important to have this painter so much linked to the region, but also to the history of the institution, also to the history of my country, because Switzerland, as we know it today, it was founded in 1848, before it was just separated cantons, separated regions. And all of this, of this kind of the beginning of our modern life was in the same time. And when you uh, visited this exhibition, you really got, I realized that younger generations have no idea of the connection between industrialization and romantic, or they are not aware that Switzerland is just 175 years old. So uh, we really gave a lot of historical and political social context to these paintings. Uh, and on can, the right, yeah. Can you tell us instead about the, uh... Uh, Hockney and also this idea of the moving focus, the, the title of the mm -hmm. exhibition. Also, Hockney is such a you know big name, and uh, what really brought you to work with uh, an artist like him? Um, Hockney is a superstar, and he's very often shown. And um, I got the offer to get um, um, a volume of interesting works as a loan, uh, but not big enough for our museum because I have that much space. So I was thinking of what could be interesting for me from, from today's perspective. And I'm really into contemporary art and I'm into political sciences and in social questions. And then I was aware that um, Hockney is such an old man, a male figure, but he is um, an idol to me in in um, the meaning of he is so curious. He is always going on and on. He's very successful today, but if you think about his homosexuality and how many of his friends he lost during the 80s and during the 90s um, due to HIV, um, it is uh, very surprising that he is that optimistic and that positive. And he says um, he was based in L.A. and in Great Britain. And today he lives in Normandy in France. 
And during the pandemic, he published a book, a conversation between him and a friend, an art historian, and the title was Spring Cannot Be Cancelled. And maybe that's something we also could, in these difficult times today, have in mind. There is always something which is going on in a good way and which can give you hope. And there is no option to to be just frustrated and and depressed and resignate. So I, it must go on somehow. I feel that, uh, I mean, I really wanted to focus on these two blockbusters, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we encounter these exhibitions and we feel, okay, it's another, you know, but I think to hear your words, you really understand that sometimes we need to just dig a little bit to understand that even the most uh, obvious, uh, you know, like what we think is just, you know, name dropping, in fact, can reveal some uh, stories and some details and some uh, um, uh, kind of path that uh, are not there when we know. And this is so much part of the curatorial practice, because again, you know, there's millions ways, million ways and million reasons to do a Turner show. But the reason you just told us makes it completely unique. So it's, this is uh, super interesting. Um, now I want to go to this sentence and um, I just want to read it again because I think it's so powerful and then we will move on. Um, the museum is an institution with the power to rewrite and redefine art history. I think, uh, especially from someone like you who didn't start, didn't study art history and from someone like me who also didn't study art history, <laughs> I think this is an interesting, uh, you know, we are... Uh, like, I, I think uh, 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 if you could just uh, tell us when you realized this uh, motto, when you kind of came to the idea that this is what the museum should do, or, or with, with which exhibition told you in a way, like, this is, you know, this is what I want to do with the museum. From the beginning on, that's the reason why it is so great to be a director and to, um, prepare a program and I have to present it first to a commission and I have to agree, but I often visit exhibitions somewhere and I really fall in love with art pieces. Like with soundtrack by Guy Benner, I saw it at Art Basel in Basel and I fell in love with this piece. And I did some research, I contacted his gallery, Edith Sommer, and I decided, yeah, let's do it. Give, it, give him 1,100 square meters and have just nine or 10 videos on. And I see that institutions are somehow an alternative to the art market sometimes. And I define my program as a very feminist program, but this doesn't mean that we just present female positions or more than half of the positions must be female or queer. I mean, feminism in a way of being aware that there are some mechanisms and structures that help, that um, are, um, are suppressing some names or that some positions are overseen, marginalized, forgotten. And as a, in a feminist perspective, you are aware of this and you are look a bit around the corner, a bit deeper, you have to put away the dust a bit and then probably you find something which is surprising and new. And names like Hockney or Turner, they help me that there is a lot of attention towards the institution. and. In the shadow, or when when these masters are shipped away again, you install something new, for, not from the youngest uh, generation. It, it's not a mass. It's not, but it can also be like we both did an exhibition with Marion Baru. She's ninety something. She's yeah. the old lady. Yeah, maybe we can uh, move to because that's actually my next question. If you can speak about uh, Marion Baruch. Uh, which we also showed at CCA. I hope uh, some of you had the opportunity to see the exhibition. And also Vivian Suter, um, tell us about these two figures, because I think they give so much about, it. they encapsulate your work in so many ways. Marian Baruch um, was invited to a group show by Noah Stolz, and he was my guest curator. And I, I fell in love with her pieces, but also with her person. And then Noah said he wants to deep 
deep, uh, go deeper into her work and he would like to do a publication and he's looking for a partner institution because he is a freelance curator here in Switzerland. And I said to him, if you are ready, if you went through all the archive material, come back because I would like to be the partner. I would like to offer my exhibition space. And we did that and we did also a publication and uh, I could not have spent all this time going into it's the publication. Articles. Yeah, it's out of print. Sorry, I'm doing uh, publicity, <laughs> but you cannot buy because it's out of print. Let's hope they print again or you can come to CCA to borrow it from me. But you can continue, Fanny. I would not have the time to go into the artist's archive yeah. and, and to work that yeah. up. And But Noah does not have the space to do such a huge, huge exhibition. So we come together. And it was quite very successful. Since then, Mar Marion Baruch has new galleries, new contacts. She's now part of some important collections in Europe. I hope also in Israel. I don't know. Yeah, that's the piece she did for the very uh, first and biggest room. And she's yes. working with the leftovers of textile industry, factory, fabric factories, where you, where they cut out pieces for fashion and with the leftovers she's working. We are talking about an artist who is 94, so we cannot go mm -hmm. inside her work for, you know, in such a limited time. But I think what is important is that she's an artist, a female artist. I just want to give a few details about her life because it's so interesting. Born in Romania, she came to Israel in the 50s, studied in Bezalel, had her first show in Tel Aviv in the 50s, then moved to Rome, married an Italian man, lived between Italy and France, and now lives in Italy, and she's 94. And being such a peripatetic, being such a nomadic artist when such condition was not even understood, made her an outcast. And I think... Uh, Fanny's decision to give her the first retrospective at the age of 92, 91. This is something that when we say about rewrite history, rewrite art history, this is exactly what it means, you know, uh, that uh, a museum can take the choice to do this. And I think similarly for uh, Vivian uh, Suter, um, if you can tell us, about how you discover her work and how was the, the pro just briefly, you know, it to mm -hmm. the, for people to understand mm -hmm. the vibe, you know. Marion Baro, uh, Vivian Zuta, you see here the very first room again, and it's with 220 canvases free hanging from the ceiling. And you have probably seen similar um, installations by her at Documenta in Kassel or on Highline in New York or in, in Madrid, uh, in Prado or in several galleries. Um, I discovered Vivian Zutte uh, in Kassel at Documenta and I realized that she is Swiss and she had an exhibition in the 80s in Switzerland, but then she left the country, went to Guatemala because she needed some distance to the scene here. It was a very critical, seen towards her free um, kind of painting. It's all about feeling and intuition. It's not about a conceptual art or so. And it was due to um, Adam Shimshik, the former director of Kunsthalle Basel in Basel, who has been the director of Document and Kassel and who presented her in Kassel in such an interesting way. And then I started to do have her, uh, to go into her work and I wanted to know what was before she left Switzerland and what was before she started to have all her paintings as free hanging canvases from the ceiling. And I realized that well, no one did a retrospective with her. She started with um, paperwork and she started with many layers of painting and it was very heavy canvases and she started with gouaches. And it was never seen before. And I was interested to get the attention from critics and visitors via these well-known free hanging installations in the first room. But in the other rooms, what we told was a different story. And we managed also to do the very first monograph of her work. I think again, uh, uh, Fanny, I think it's uh, these two figures, they really, you know, um, I think somehow also to be in Lucerne, you know, in this uh, town that is, of course, in Switzerland, in a main place in Europe, but still not, you know, Zurich or not the big city. Not the center, no. <laughs> no, kind of give you the, the really the freedom in a way to 
be a, a beacon for a, a different way of getting inside the, the field, which is not the one that uh, everybody approves. It's really kind of like it's a freedom that I'm talking from, from Tel Aviv, Yafo, I think. Also, it uh, should be a way to think, you know, that uh, we have uh, a liberty that uh, other places uh, uh, don't have. So um, I agree. I I wanted to uh, ask you about uh, uh, Katarzyna Sheda because this is a nice story. You can tell us the the story about this artist uh, because it's a nice story and kind of tells a little bit about uh, your work. She was my very first exhibition here in Luzern and I got a lot of troubles because the stakeholders of the museum, this is again, the very first room um, with 100 round tables and the round tables I collected among within our members. So I was asking to give us a round table and the, the fabric on it is from the artist and you got free entrances as many as people could sit around the table. And uh, the audience here in Luzern, they were really shocked that I started with something ridiculous like this. It's not beautiful, it's ugly. You see the, the, the tables do not fit to each other and these fabrics with the hole in the center, it's something very childish and it's, it looks homemade. It looks like a, a social workshop. It doesn't look like art. And also that Katarzyna Jeda has a special signs from the Czech language in her name and people didn't know how to pronounce it properly. So and they got angry about this. And uh, she was uh, then even, she is younger than I am. So she was middle of 30, 30 something or beginning of 30 years old. And she's a tiny person. So she really looks like a student. She doesn't look like a cool artist. And I, I had, then the impression that um, the audience did not uh, realize that I'm taking this institution for serious, that they had to feel like I'm, I'm joking about it. It's ironic, but it wasn't. It was just a break between what the former director did and what I wanted to do. I really want to do um, exhibitions where people can dive in. But sometimes that's painting. Sometimes it's a social project. I want to have a kind of um, intensity. This is what I'm longing for. And speaking of intensity, and we are heading towards the end. The last question: you you ex you did a mid career uh, mid, uh, mid career uh, exhibition for Roy Rosen. Now <laughs> you have on view a mid career exhibition for uh, Guy Benner. and next year you will do an exhibition with Maya Dunit. So three Israeli artists. Uh, that you are uh, uh, supporting and presenting. And uh, everybody here knows their work or supposed to, and they have uh, plenty of opportunity. But from you, we want to hear like an anecdote, a story about uh, each of them that uh, we won't read uh, anywhere. I think that's the kind of, uh, she can share. I was a bit forced to meet with Sergio Edelstein. Okay. I got a recommendation from a, um, a friend and I was not that sure. So I met him and I was just, it was very inspiring. And we realized we were both forced by this, the same person to meet and we didn't feel like, but we had to. And then we were so relieved that it is interesting to talk together. And we decided to do an exhibition together. And he suggested to do it with um, Roy Rosen. You mixed the, the, the names and ah. the pictures oh, yeah. the audience that's, know. Yeah, that's right. That's and right. we did this publication here. It was last year. And it was just after the exhibition of um, Hockney. And I was so delighted to have this very smart, very um, catchy, very colorful, but very hard, very political, very strict, uh, very brutal oeuvre here in, 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 as, a, as the next chapter after Hockney. And it was not to please the people, but to shake people and to, to bring them back to some urgent questions of contemporary life. And, and, and you were talking about one series that was really re, re, like a prophetic, you were... Mm -hmm. I said, I told you yesterday that um, you probably know this um, series of drawings 
um, Vladimir's Night, and it's about Vladimir Putin, and it's from 2011. And last winter, the audience really was so touched by the prophetic um, sense of the artist because it was when we were in the middle of the first winter with the Ukrainian war. And um, they could not believe that an artist has this um, power or this um, skills to know a bit more and to be, know a bit ahead what could happen. And it was also somehow that I could prove that art and artists are um, are not just to please us. They are really there to, to tell us something about today's life. Sure. And for Guy Benner, uh, that just opened like last week. So it's yes, really- Yes, we did also a publication. The title is We Have Lost, another prophetic title. Um, we opened it last week and it was a very strange opening with half the numbers of visitors we usually have. But people and I, my speech was different than usually. I, I felt like um, in a church and it was very quiet and very serious. But um, people really stayed. Um, they didn't run for the buffet for a drink or something of food. They really stayed in the um, video installations and they they got um, lost or they, they got stuck in these videos. And to say it very general, if you think of Swiss artists, famous Swiss artists like Roman Siegner, Pippi Lotterist, Fischli Weiss, but also the, the uh, following generations, the younger generations, it's often so playful. And there's a tiny humor. It's a joke, but it's also a bit childish. It's a bit um, bricolage, self-made aesthetics. And when I look in this very general way to Israel, I see that you have these serious topics to deal with in your art that probably therefore you have this uh, very interesting, very uh, promising video art scene. I know that many um, Israeli video artists. It's surprising, no? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think also it was interesting you were saying that it, the show is very intense. And I think, again, it's a challenge because people have to come back. I mean, and this was uh, something that uh, it's quite unique that there's an exhibition where you have to come again and again. So I think we are uh, running out of time. Uh, so I don't know if there's uh, any question um, uh, or we are... Uh... I don't... I don't see any question right now yet, but maybe I can, uh, if someone has a question, can write in the chat or I can open it for uh, five minutes uh, for the uh, audience and do. And, um, I think uh, uh, if we want to give a few minutes for people, if they have any question to write in the chat, um, first of all, I would like to really uh, say thank you to uh, Fanny for uh, really being with us and sharing um, her story and uh, this museum, which we should all uh, visit soon, we hope. And I just want to also um, present our next session, which will be on November 30. It will be a dialogue between uh, Yasmil Raymond and Tamar Margalit. Uh, Tamar is a curator at CCA. And Yasmil, she's the director of Porticus which is a exhibition space in Frankfurt. And they both were uh, colleagues at MoMA. So again, there's a collegial kind of uh, spirit that uh, bring them together. So uh, save the date for uh, November 30. Uh, if there's any question, Daphna, you see some yes, questions? I don't see any, I don't see any yes. questions. I yes. would like, uh, uh -huh. I, oh, I do have, ah. okay. Um, okay, I do have one question. Dear Fanny, why do you think there are so many video ops? Oops. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, it's from Natalie Cohen from Paris. Uh, why do you think there are so many video artists in Israel? Um, it could be that Sergio Edelstein had the bit because he was very much interested in video and I know he did a program at CCA very much focusing on uh, video. But 
if I would not know um, Sergio, then I would say you have this really serious and sad and demanding topics in your daily life. While here in Switzerland, it's safe, it's clean, we are on time, public transport is working on time every day, we have no strikes. And, uh, but it's almost too perfect. And therefore I think that Swiss artists tend a bit to go to, to handmade, um, joyful objects or drawings and, and make it like something with play, which is not burned, like um, some pieces by um, Tishri Weiss. And I, I, I think that you have found in Israel a way to tell stories about your daily life but not in a one-to-one -one version but in a metaphoric way if we think of Yael Bardana or Mika Rottenberg they find a way to talk about um, serious problems without calling them directly or they have so many layers you can just see um, a fairy tale or you can see a metaphor for something else but if you are aware that Mika Rottenberg has strong links to Israel then you see something different we have thank another you, question you know, I think I think okay, we have thank another you from, you got, thank you from Natalie ah. uh, and Nicholas, you, can stop share. you can stop sharing uh, your presentation yeah, sure. I have I one wonder, big is question. There any other question? I will Rita, ask. Rita. Yes, I know that you know, we all know how challenging these times are. And I wondered if at the opening of Guy Benair, funny you had any political response. Guy was so kind to offer to postpone the exhibition. But that's something I would never have done. It's not about having an empty museum, but I think it's very important to have a voice like his um, on, to be visible and to be, um, as a museum, also kind of a park where people just can gather. And it's not a, the, it's not a political debate. We have to come to a solution or to win something. It's We can have several voices but we can also just be silent. And in this book, we have lost, I had to, to talk about the title, we have lost. And in this book is an article by a colleague and her title for her essay is, and I want to share with you, um, <clears throat> just a second, um, art can help. And it's something I, I really believe in. It's not that art must help, but it can help. It can help that we find some power and energy to go on and to be friendly with our neighbors, our families, and with unknown people in the street. And I was speaking about the responsibility of a museum in, my, in the opening. And I was also saying, it's not being for Israel or against Israel, it's being for freedom, peace, and for dialogue and um i it's it's really i i'm so happy that you invited me because i feel it's so strange today who is speaking with whom everybody with everybody should be just what you do no that, that's why we are here tonight yeah thank you for inviting me no nicola really it's a gift uh, i have uh, one question can i have one question sure uh, just one question. Uh, while we were talking yesterday, um, you're talking. We were talking about the new, the new people who are coming, the new generation of people who are coming to the museum. And you were talking today about uh, the diversity that you, when you are curating exhibition, it's very diversity. So after David Hockney, you bring Roy Rosen, someone that the people do not know, and actually things that are not familiar people doesn't know even to pronounce the name of the artist and they and you say Ted when you when you just started 12 years ago people were annoyed but not anymore can you say a little bit I mean what changed with the clientele and or what happened with the approach of what museum what is the, why people come to the museum for I um I think that the discussion in media and in society the last few years about diversity and diversity means richness 
And inclusion means we are more than just this specific group of academics and white Europeans. This helped a lot that people um, got more curious and they follow their curiosity. Before they were a bit ashamed. Um, it's always about this big 20 name everybody knows on the street if you talk about art. And uh, they were offended when they didn't know how to pronounce Katashina um, Shede properly. But if I bring now an artist, and I did this um, last February with Betty Saar, a black artist, feminist artist from this, the United States, 90 years old too. And people ask me, how do you pronounce it? Betty, it's written Betty, but how do you pronounce it? And I realized it's really also a relief for the audience that they can say, yes, we have been overseeing the, all these female positions. We have forgotten about this um, man. And now I think it's not just the museums, it's it's the, the global conversation about diversity, which helped a lot. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So uh, save the date for November 30 and uh, stay safe. And uh, we will see each other very soon. And CCA is open. We have a wonderful exhibition of Etia Bergil. It's open free of charge. So come visit us. We have a shelter nearby. So please uh, come and enjoy our program. And we will see each other soon. Thank you so much.